very interesting uh, inputs also and uh, well, i'm sure that we will discuss on the financing of some of the uh, and some of the aspects of uh, r d also uh, and now i have the privilege to introduce michael please go ahead michael so i'd like to share my perspective as an economist who's done work on both on how to incentivize incentivize uh, research and development and also on economics in low and middle income countries more generally. Now, some of my early work on R&D incentives was on patents. And you know, the standard uh, economic analysis of patents is that they perform the role of trying to incentivize research and development, obviously a really critical role. But the way they do that is by granting monopolies to inventors. And that can tend to reduce access. So when you have debates over, there, you know, a long history of debates over patents, and that's because there's an inherent tension. On the one hand, trying to promote research and development incentives. On the other hand, doing so in a manner that can reduce access. And you know, the debate over patent waivers is the latest chapter of that. Now, if you, if you think that both of these objectives are important, then that suggests we should try to think about other tools for incentivizing research that actually promote access at the same time. And so in the early 2000s, Rachel Glenister and I proposed the idea of advanced market commitments for vaccines against diseases common in low-income countries. So advanced market commitments are legal commitments made by governments or donors that create incentives for research and development, and but also require manufacturers to build an, enough manufacturing capacity to deliver access for everybody covered by the advanced market commitment, or to put a commit to a cap on prices uh, uh, following the end of the AMC to uh, provide access. We initially proposed this thinking about uh, diseases like malaria, but in 2007, a group of, of donors, together with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, provided up to $1.5 billion to support purchase of a pneumococcal vaccine covering the strains of disease common in low-income countries in exchange for commitment by firms to cap prices. Subsequent to that, three vaccines were developed uh, against those strains. Hundreds of millions of people have now been vaccinated. An estimated 700,000 lives have been saved by those pneumococcal vaccines. And vaccine coverage levels caught up to rich country levels nearly five years faster than for comparable vaccines not supported by advanced contracting. So based in part on that work, um, when the COVID-19 pandemic emerged, I, I was approached by a, a several governments and international organizations asking about vaccine financing uh, options for COVID-19. So I contacted some colleagues and we formed a research group called Accelerating Health Technologies. And, and much of the analysis today is from that group. Um, so I think that while we were focused on COVID-19, I think some of this would apply to future pandemics, um, but you know, I'm not an expert on influenza obviously and would, uh, you know, would love to get feedback. Um, so you know, our first, and most basic finding was that manufacturing capacity for vaccines has enormous, uh, not just health value, but unfortunately people are sometimes motivated by the financial aspects. So um, that has enormous financial value, value uh, to society during a pandemic. And it's much more valuable if it's available earlier. You know, that seems very obvious, but I think the magnitudes are hard to wrap your head around. So the IMF estimated that, that uh, COVID-19 is costing the world economy the equivalent of $500 billion every month. And you know, more comprehensive estimates, including the health and education costs, are many, many times larger. And if you, that, that gives values per dose of vaccine or per course of annual capacity that are unimaginable relative to uh, the normal way we think about vaccines. You know, we estimated that installing capacity for 3 billion annual vaccine courses had global benefits, the, the first uh, 3 billion, of $17.4 trillion, over $5,800 per course. 
the you know the the um that that just means that the value of investments is extremely high the value to society and it's worth investing uh in parallel with multiple you know building our capacity in parallel with clinical trials even though in our analysis we assumed a very low chance of success for each vaccine but while the social value of this is very high the private value to companies of installing additional capacity is much smaller so you know for example um, if we if we move ahead to early 2021 you know, we estimated the value is $1900 uh, per course of annual capacity the prices to manufacturers you know they may you know, i realize these are challenging for many countries but they're still only 6 to 40 dollars uh, per course so that means that to provide proper incentives requires very large government investment and you know so so together with colleagues we provide uh, uh, pro advised for a modified form of advanced contracting early in the pandemic so governments could pay to install enough manufacturing capacity to vaccinate the uh, the entire population for each of several uh, promising vaccine candidates actually for um, and in exchange companies would agree to sell vaccines at a pre-specified price if they prove successful in trials. And th that would allow capacity installation to occur in parallel with vaccine testing, saving valuable time. Um, now we actually estimated that this would have been worth it on financial uh, terms, even for low and middle income countries, not just for high income countries. And there were, some of this was done, but in our, you know, not, we, we argued that much more should be done. So Operation Warp Speed, the UK's vaccine task force, and some other governments and international organizations did sign some advanced contracts for vaccines. And we, you know, they arguably quadrupled, tripled to quadrupled global vaccine manufacturing capacity and delivered vaccines at unprecedented speed and scale beyond what many thought possible. And the programs paid for themselves many times over. We estimate that Operation Warp Speed with just 13 billion uh, of spending helped accelerate, you know, that would have paid for itself if it accelerated vaccination by just 12 hours. Um, that's the sort of order of magnitude that we're talking about. So the implication for future pandemics if, is that if there's even a moderate risk of a flu pandemic, it makes sense to install in, to invest in installing supply chain capacity, and vac uh, van vaccine manufacturing capacity, you know, defined comprehensively, not narrowly, um, uh, because of you know, even a very small chance that this would be needed would justify that investment on financial terms. Um, okay. I'd also like to note that this promotes equity. And the simple way to think of that is, you know, if you have a queue that's two years long and you can double production, that cuts the queue to one year long. That's a small benefit for those at the front of the queue, but for those at the back of the queue, this moves it from a two-year wait to a one-year wait, a very substantial benefit. Um, the, the other issue, which is more subtle uh, you know, from an economics point of view as a matter of game theory, is that during a shortage, you know, when you have this big gap between social value and price, that's the classic situation of a shortage. By the way, let me be clear. I'm not suggesting we raise the price to, uh, to match the social value. Just suggesting we recognize the social reality that in the middle of a pandemic, it's not going to, there's going to be this gap between social value and price. In that situation, governments have a, a very strong incentives you know, uh, to, to prioritize their domestic population. And that means taking actions like export bans, or hoarding of vaccines that provide some help to their own country, but that uh, really devastate the uh, the global uh, the global response. And you know there have been moral appeals to deal with that, and I you know I support those moral appeals. But I think we also have to be realistic. Uh, you know, economists think in terms of incentives, including incentives for politicians. So we really need to change the incentives for politicians as well as you know, uh, appeal to their sense of ethics. And you know, one way to change the incentives for politicians is to make sure that we've got lots of capacity in place, including capacity for intermediate inputs. 
so that in a pandemic, governments don't face those same incentives to ban exports and hoard vaccines. And if, you know, I think that's very important because supply chains are global. And if we have those incentives in place, and also we don't know which vaccines will succeed. We got lucky this time, you know, it turned out many candidates succeeded. Next time we might have a smaller number of candidates succeeding, in which case having the ability to draw on, on vaccines globally is very important. And um, so you know, the other thing, um, which I'd, I'd love to talk about uh, later is finding ways to uh, extend the capacity we do have through dose stretching strategies. I know I used up some time uh, uh, fiddling with my microphone. I don't know whether I should go into that now or, or come back later. 